very well. Um, let me again, before we go into the question, and, uh, or rather, in the feedback, let me again read the philosophy that this man uh, followed, which he practiced. It says here, by way of advice, it says, no individual has any right to come into this world and go out of it without leaving behind him or her distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. Let me explain what he means. You can't just come in, the, in this earth and all you do is basically nothing, just a wasted life, wasted life. No benefit even to show, not even nothing, just nothing. You just, they just say, so-and-so lived on earth and he died, period. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant with the weak and the strong, because someday in life, you will have been all of these. That's the first philosophy that he followed. With regards to students, and you are a lot of them here, students, learn to do common things and commonly well. Common things. They ask you, today you are the one who is sweeping the classroom. Make sure you really sweep including those corners, sweep, such that when people come, they should be able to say, wow, whoever swept, really swept. Not me, these things, were the ablution blocks. There will be times when you need to clean the ablution blocks. For those of you who think ablution block is a technical, a toilet, cleaning the toilets. When they ask you to clean those toilets, let people see that truly somebody has worked here. If you were following the presentation, you will agree with me that the university that our friend went to, he himself was shocked to find that they actually had to build their own university. They had a, a good work culture where they applied themselves. I think these are the things that we should perhaps later on be speaking to as takeaways. Very well then. This session will be very short in terms of the feedback. What we will do is that I am more interested in the students. The students we will not finish all 15 groups, but I will call them at random to allow us to uh, get the feedback that, that we're looking for in terms of have people really understood? Have you got the ethos that we're trying to relate in this seminar? These seminars have an objective. It's not just listening to one Kasote Singogo speaking on and on and so forth and so forth. No. They have an ethos. They have a purpose. They have an objective. They have a goal. Okay? So what we'll do is I want to start with group 12. Group 12. Aha. Uh -huh. There we are. In group 12, there must have been a student, isn't it? So in that group 12, I want you to speak. Do we have a mic going around? Mic? So group 12, I want a student, not Kawata Baptist members, no. A student. I think there was a hand here. I want you to group group 12. I thought group 12. Where are the who were in group 12? Uh-huh. And of these group 12, how many are from ACU? Uh-huh. In group 12, how many are from ACU? Show of hands. Yes, you are the ones we are looking for. Yeah. So group 12, those from ACU. The lovely gentleman there in uh, blue with a cross, 
means that you must have an answer. What I want you to do is, I want you to give me what your response was to question number two. What challenges do the poor and disadvantaged have here in Zambia that often prevent them from reaching their highest potential? Uh, I would... So uh, I will start first by greeting everyone here. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, so uh, the question was, let me look for the question, sorry. What challenges do the poor and disadvantaged have here in Zambia that often prevent them from reaching their highest potential. So, uh, the poor, the challenges that they have, first of all, they have that the challenge of funds. For the poor, it is hard to have money to give their children or young ones to do what, to go to school. So, that is the first challenge. They have the challenge of funds. They don't have funds. Yeah. And secondly, the poor are uh, also have the problem of self-confident, self-esteem. Their self-esteem is low. So when someone is poor, he or she downgrades herself that I won't make it because of this and this of this. I don't have connections. I don't have what. So he or she will downgrade her or himself. Yeah. Then also the poor... Uh, So the poor also lack exposure. Mm. Yeah, they lack exposure like when someone has money and other things, they, they go to places, they meet different, different types of people which encourage, which encourage them to do what they want to do. And when you are poor, it's like you segregate yourself from those people who are doing well. So you won't have that exposure that they can maybe connect you to other things. Yeah, that's what I can say. Okay, Thank all right, all right. Maybe you can clap for him. Uh, yeah. All right. Awesome. Okay, now, uh, um, group 10, group 10. Was there a student in group 10? Of those hands who are at SEU, group 10. You know, uh, you remember he said you must be truthful, eh? So, uh -huh. those in group 10 and you are at SU, hand. Uh -huh. So now, those of you, maybe that same lady behind there, so that it's the same robe, blue to... Uh -huh. So, madam, for you in group 10, I'm interested in the response to question number three. What principles in uh, Kavia's life and what people around him helped him to overcome the hurdles in his life? That's what I want to hear from you. Please just give the answer, not the gum, no, just the answer. <laughs> All right. The first answer is perseverance. And then the second answer is his stepmother gave him a book to learn how to read. He was determined. Yeah. I think that's it. So, did, uh, is this, uh, what, uh, what helped him to overcome the hurdles in his life? The principle, yes. What hurdles? What, what helped him to overcome the hurdles? Question three, right? Huh? Oh, you want to do CNN? You are allowed. Okay. Were you in group 10? Yes. 
And you participated? Yes. Oh, okay. That boy was one of those in the Was it so possible to be in group 10 and not participate? I don't know. Ask me. He's in part 10. Uh-huh. All right. Quickly. No, I think five seconds. Read the question for me, please. I should read the question for you? Yes. But you were in group 10? Yes. Okay. I'll read the question. What principles in Kavia's life and what people around him helped him to overcome the hurdles in his life? Mm, it was perseverance. And then his stepmother gave him a book to read. He was determined. Okay. okay. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Let's quickly, the last one is group eight. Group eight. Group eight. There was no group eight. Group eight. In that group eight, eh, in that group eight, how many of you are from ACU? Group eight. And from ACU, here, 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 here. Question number four. Question number four. What can help a young man or woman today to overcome the hurdles that prevent many from reaching their highest potential and being greatly used in life? Okay, uh, I think what can help a young man or woman this time around, I think one who needs to have passion, inner passion. Uh, secondly, the person needs to know, I mean, they need to know themselves. You need to know what you're capable of doing and you need to know that this is how God created me. You, need, you don't need to, uh, to lower your self-esteem. Yeah. Uh, thirdly, uh, fourth, whatever. Yeah. Uh, having a dream and a goal, that one can uh, make someone to... So I can't see where whatever is fitting. Where <laughs> because I'm not sure at what number I am at because I said a lot of points in one point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. when, so, when, when you, those from ACU, when you go back to ACU, <laughs> please go and revisit these questions. Or yeah? should I do that? Go and sir? revisit these questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, group one. Group one. Uh -huh. Now, in group one, how many of those in group one are from ACU? From, okay. There's a hand there. All right. I want you to respond to question number one. Okay. What challenges did George Washington Cavier face that would have prevented him from reaching his highest potential? That's an easy one. Okay. So one of the things that we immediately talked about was how he did not grow up with parents and how vital we usually see that that is, even statistically, to how well a child will do once they, once they have grown up, how successful they will be is, do they have a mom and a dad? And so that is very encouraging and very impressive that even though he did not grow up with parents, um, he still became, by God's grace, what he, what he did. We also saw things like racism, um, specifically rejection from colleges. We talked about how you couldn't imagine you're trying to do all of these things and then you're just getting shut down by everyone. How would you have the perseverance, like was talked about earlier, to keep going? And so those were two of the big things. We also talked about health being a hindrance um, and the people at college in general, just general racism. So those were some of the things that we talked about. Thank you very much. Okay, we, we are running out of time. We will, like I say, for those who are students ACU, this was for you. Really, I would like to see that uh, you go and revisit these uh, questions amongst yourselves and continue the discussion. I'll follow you up. Okay, um, what I would like us to do now is to go into the next session. And uh, before we go into the next session, 
just a few minutes to promote some books here. This one is entitled Africa's Bravest Heart, and it shows there Robert Moffat. Many, many years ago, about 20 years ago when I was working, I actually worked with someone on the board, a Mr. Moffat, who has a genealogy that, you know, is referred to, to this Moffat here. It's one family, and they live somewhere in uh, the Mukushi area where they run a farm. Africa's Brave Heart, okay, by Irene Howard. There's another book here, The Divine Inspiration of the Bible by A.W. Pink, Arthur W. Pink. These are books that I would encourage you to own. I told you earlier on that I bought my first Bible in 1978 as a young man in secondary school. Revised Standard Version, I still have it. Okay? So it is a good practice to buy books. All right? So this is a very good book, divine, The Divine Inspiration of the Bible. This is a book which I always say is a must-have, a summary of Christian doctrine by Louis Becker. If you are a serious Christian, as serious as George was, and you don't have this book, your seriousness will be doubted. Many years ago, we had a, our annual conference, and uh, one of the conference speakers visited our home in in Hillview, when we lived in Hillview. And uh, what I said to him was that the average Christian in a Reformed Baptist church has a summary of the Christian doctrine. And he said, wow, we thought that's only for those in Bible school. All right, having said that, and having set the tone, sorry, Pastor, we, we have taken, eaten a bit of your time, but you are allowed to also eat into our time because this eating is double entry. Let me call upon Pastor Mbewe now to come and continue the session. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's how we welcome people at SCU. So <laughs> now here, suddenly, they are being a little squeezed. Otherwise, they would have been clapping for the speaker. Well, we've come to our third and last session now. And uh, um, let's see. Yeah, so it's cover the renowned scientist. Cover the renowned scientist. Uh, Cover's Christian faith enabled him to look beyond human skin color and consider all human beings as equal before God because all human beings were made in the image of God. And so he worked for racial harmony. As this became more well known, he was invited to speak at different functions by the Young Men's Christian Association for him to help improve relations between blacks and whites, knowing that if he can impact the young, then that would be promising as they grow up further. On one occasion, he was asked to speak at a place called Blue Ridge about race relations. And when he got there, the young men at that YMCA were initially not happy when they noticed a black man standing up to begin speaking to them. You have to understand it was a complete all-white congregation. Instead of speaking about race relations, instead he spoke about nature and science. By the time he finished, they were so intrigued by this man's winsome knowledge that they raptured in applause and walked forward to congratulate him. Indirectly, he actually spoke about race relations. What he showed them 
was simply that the skin, the color of a man's skin, actually does not determine who he is by just the way he exhibited himself. But Carver is best known historically as the peanut man or the father of the peanut industry. How did that name come about? The way I hope we will do this is, uh, uh, I've got some granites there. Uh, I, I want each one of you to get one, only one, eh? So if, if the ushers can help to pass them around. I want each one of us to have one of these and hang on to it. And while that's happening, by the way, uh, SCU students, please don't go away without re-registering yourself. Okay, you registered yourselves when you came. I hope you did. Okay, so re-register yourselves because it's only those who came in the morning and have remained until the end who have something, something. We won't talk about what it is. That's a secret among ourselves. Okay. Yeah, so Joseph, just make sure that you have another piece of paper, another piece of paper for them to register as they leave. Okay. Let's make sure about that. Um, I think we, we need to do it faster, otherwise we will fail. That method won't work. That method won't work. Aha, uh -huh, good. Thank you, thank you. Just don't finish them. I need to eat the leftovers at home. <laughs> Pay kind favor of Mr. Bota. <laughs> okay. All right. So while they are being distributed, at a certain point, I will ask us to, to raise them up. So at the time when um, um, George Washington Carver was lecturing at um, the, the university, the main crop in the 19th century for the southern states of America was not peanuts or groundnuts as we call them. Rather, it was cotton and tobacco. By the start of the 20th century, the land on which they were planting cotton and tobacco had lost a lot of its nutrients, and thus the yield had become very poor. The result is that the income that was coming in to the cotton uh, growing farmers was getting less and less and less. So in the process, the farmers could no longer support the many workers that previously they had. And so they, they basically laid off quite a number of them. And then the smaller farmers were also failing to farm on their own, and therefore they began to literally rent themselves out to farmers to work for them for no pay. Simply that when finally there's a harvest, they can at least have a share of that harvest. That's how bad the economy in the South had become. They were borrowing money with a view that when I get my next harvest, I'll pay. And then that next harvest was so bad, they could not pay. And consequently, they began again giving themselves over to people to be used freely because they've already consumed the, the finances and so forth. So the, the, the people were trapped in a never-ending cycle of poverty and debt. Nkongole is what I mean by debt. And it was getting deeper 
and deeper and deeper. As we often say, if a person comes to you, he's not your friend, you just know him, and he says he wants to borrow money from you, just say no. The reason is most likely he has finished the circle of his friends. He's getting deeper. So even when he's saying to you, per month end, I will pay you per month end, he has said that to a number of people already, and they are after him. Okay, so it was that bad in the context of these individuals. In the end, it was as bad as the days of slavery. As bad as the days of slavery, because they were now serving. It's like they've bought you. The situation was made worse by what I referred to earlier as the ball weaver, which invaded the land from the south, from Mexico, in 1914 to 1915. As if this was not enough, the First World War, bang, came. And I think you remember, the First World War hit in 1914, which led to a shortage of crops and food because the economy had basically collapsed as it more and more resources were being poured into warfare. Something needed to be done. We've already noted how Carver pioneered the use of the crop rotation system. But the way he did it was by looking at alternative crops to introduce to the farmers. And because he was a soil scientist, he had already seen how where they were growing cotton, the, the level of nitrogen in the soil was getting less and less and less and less. Well, he discovered that where groundnuts, they call them peanuts, where peanuts were being grown, nitrogen levels were abnormally high. So all he did was to encourage the farmers so that one year they grow peanuts, the following year they grow cotton or whatever it was they were growing, and that way the yield began to go up and up and up and up. So that was one thing. So it was peanuts, soya beans, sweet potatoes, black eye beans, and so on, which he encouraged them to grow. But also, he discouraged the use of commercial fertilizer and instead found other ways in which to enrich the soil, partly because commercial fertilizer was expensive. So it was taking away the little money that people were earning. But secondly, it was the damage it was still leaving behind with the chemicals in the soil. He worked hard to try and just change the situation by adding value to crops so that people can have a greater reason why they should grow them. And as he was seeking to find ways and means to do that, he found that the groundnut, that's why I wanted all of us to hold, can I see if you have yeah, 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 excellent, excellent. He found that the groundnut was the one that produced the most value, the groundnut. It is because of this that Carver was credited with saving the South from economic collapse in the early part of the 20th century. So, as Carver labored in research. 
The thing that he made him go that far was this, that up to this point, groundnuts were being grown purely to feed animals. That's all, to feed animals. Now, you're not going to have many farmers growing groundnuts because what's going to happen is this, that you'll have a super abundance of groundnuts in one year, not more than you need to, to feed your animals, that in the end, well, nobody's going to buy your groundnuts. So what he did was he, he began to, in his lab, to, to do tests with groundnuts in order for him to arrive at other things that you can make out of groundnuts. Now, I hope we can all open our groundnuts. Let's, let's, so that you pull out. I hope you're not one of those who find there's nothing inside. You know, groundnuts have the capacity. Okay, so if you're one of those, you can borrow from your friend next time. So, he developed, listen, this is very important. He developed 300 products out of this little groundnut. 300 products. Let me mention just a few. Just a few. Glue, grease, bleach, dyes, writing ink, shoe polish, shaving cream, cosmetics, shampoo, furnishing cream, soap, wooden stains, fillers, metal polish, paper, insulating board, meat tenderizer, cooking oil, milk, flour, instant coffee, mayonnaise, <laughs> Yeah. More than 300 uses of this little thing. And that's why I wanted you to hold it in your hands. Because all we do with this ass is yeah? swallow. And that's it. And he further popularized the use of peanut butter, which I think we all know. He also experimented with peanut-based medicines, such as antiseptics, laxatives, and so on. For sweet potatoes, he found 118 uses as well. 118 uses. So most of these discoveries never went beyond the laboratory because in terms of turning them into commercial use, they were being pitted against other products that were already on the market that were being utilized to that end. However, at least for three of them, he went as far as having patent for them. And these were given to him in 1925 and 1927. One was for a pomade cream that he made from peanuts and then the other was a processing um, of paint and stains from clay. D 
During World War II, he actually helped to replace the textile dyes which were being imported from Europe. In other words, when you're fighting your enemies, one of the things they will do is hold back their products or inflate the price to get more money out of you. So America was able to use other means of uh, um, dye to dye the, the textile industry. And out of the soil, out of the soil, he produced 500 different shades of color. 500 different shades. So Carver was appointed as a collaborator at the United States Department of Agriculture's Division of Plant Mycology and Disease, Sur and Disease Survey rather, of the Bureau of Plant Industry. He was now on demand. He was being offered many well-paying jobs, and he was turning them down, preferring to remain at Tuskegee as a lecturer. His salary at Tuskegee then was $125 a month. Today, that's equivalent to $2,500 Roughly, that's 50,000 kwacha. That's how much he was earning per month until he died. Let me tell you one example that he turned down, just one. And it was Thomas Edison. You remember the, the gramophone? You remember the electricity? Yes. So that guy, that scientist, he had a laboratory in New York where he offered Thomas Edison $8,300 per month, which is the equivalent today of $100 and $66,000 a month. Let me give it to you in kwacha. Remember we said he was earning 50,000 kwacha a month. This offer was 3.3 million kwacha per month. He turned it down. To remain as a lecturer at Tuskegee. So figures don't lie. He turned down a fortune. But it was because he understood what his life was there for. In January 1921, when Carver was about 57 years old, he was asked to speak at a committee of the U.S. House of Representatives. So he's now reached parliament, if we could use that example. He's being asked to go and speak in parliament. What was this all about? It was to protect the peanut industry from the peanut industry that was outside America. In other words, it was proving cheaper to import peanuts into America than it was to grow them. And so the farmers were becoming disadvantaged. The best way I can use it, use an example, is uh, what has happened to the textile industry in Zambia because of Salaula. You understand? Eh? When Salaula came, that was it. Cafe textiles, down. Mulungushi textiles, down. Whatever textile, down. Just, you couldn't compete. So he went to stand now in parliament, so to speak, on behalf of 
all the peanut growers in the whole of America. And as we went there, <clears throat> you know these committees, they tend to give you a few minutes. So he, he sat there, and uh, the chairman of the committee introduced everybody. He was asked to introduce himself, which he did. And then the chairman said, uh, <clears throat> you have 10 minutes to present your case. As the tennis was coming to an end, the chairman said, um, we'll give you another 10 minutes. As the 20 minutes was coming to an end, the chairman looked at everybody else and said, uh, we'll give you another 10 minutes. By the time 30 minutes was over, the chairman said, take all the time you want. And by the time he finished, the committee gave him a standing ovation. And tariffs were introduced. Tax was put on imported peanuts that saved the peanut industry of America. It was from then that he was called the peanut man. Because remember, he has saved an entire nation's peanut industry. It is said that when Carver arrived at Tuskegee in 1896, the peanut had not even been recognized as a crop. But within the next half century, it became one of the six leading crops throughout the United States. And in the South, it was the second cash crop after cotton. In 1942, for instance, this was about a year before he died, the U.S. government allotted, listen to this, five million acres for peanuts, for, for, for those who wanted to be in peanut farming. Five million acres. Carver's efforts had finally helped liberate the South from its excessive dependence on cotton. And by the way, that's from the Britannica encyclopedia. That statement I've just mentioned to you. Carver became very famous. Now that's a huge contrast. Two weeks ago, when I asked here on Sunday morning how many people knew of George Washington Carver, out of about 400 people in here, only five raised their hands. And I said, in two weeks' time, I hope it will be the other way around, that five people will say, who is he? But the rest of us will know him. In 1928, Simpson College conferred on him an honorary doctorate. He was known as the great educator, scientist, and inventor. He was also known for his poetry and painting. He was loved for his efforts to improve racial relations. Now, I need to quickly mention here that one of the reasons why you could not convince him that white people were bad was this. He was raised by a white couple. So he obviously knew that like any race, you have the bad, sorry, the good, the bad and the ugly. And consequently, he had no problems mixing with black or white, which a lot of the blacks in the South detested because they wanted to polarize society. These are the people that enslaved us. And he couldn't buy that because 
his experience, he was raised when he, he needed the most help by a white family. Time magazine called him the Black Da Vinci. Now, that might be nothing to most of us, so let me quickly say one or two things about Leonardo da Vinci. He was an Italian who lived from 1452 to 1515. So we're talking about 500 years before, or 4,500 years before, and was famous as a painter, a draftsman, an engineer, a scientist, a sculpture, and an architect. One of his most famous paintings is the Mona Lisa, yes. You see, there are people already here who know him. The Mona Lisa, which uh, is preserved in a museum in Paris. You, you pay quite a lot to see it. So they named him as such that this someone has arisen among black Americans who is the equivalent of Leonardo da Vinci. Carver developed new varieties of cotton. In 1897, he discovered two fungi that were named after him. In fact, he collected more than 100 fungi specimens which are still housed in the New York Botanical Garden Fungus Herbarium. Three presidents met with him. Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, and Franklin Roosevelt. He later became good friends with Henry Ford, the great inventor of the Ford automobile, and helped him invent peanut rubber. <laughs> For cannons, that were used in World War II. What happened was that up to that point, the, you remember those big, big guns that are called cannons? They, they needed rubber. Now, I suppose the rubber was in the wheels that would sort of hold them back when they are firing or something. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, um, the, America was now fighting Europe. So all Europe did was to hold back that rubber. So the American government asked Ford and Carver to come up with rubber replacements. And Carver, in his lab, managed to produce rubber from groundnuts. And that's what the American soldiers used on their cannon. the boy born from slaves, whom he never saw. In fact, Henry Ford installed an elevator in the home of Carver when he was getting old so that he did not need to use stairs, and he also financed several projects at the Tuskegee Institute, including a newly a new fully equipped laboratory for Carver. I've mentioned that he was also invited to work for Thomas Edison in his laboratory in 1916, but he turned it down. At least now you know the figures that were involved in that turning down. He remained in the South because he felt the South needed him more. That's why he remained there. In fact, at one time, the crown prince of Sweden came all the way from Sweden and studied under him for three weeks. 
Now, whereas Carver was not known for globe trotting, he went to India and met with Mahatma Gandhi, whom he affectionately called my beloved friend, Mr. Gandhi. They began writing letters to each other as early as 1929, and their correspondence went on until at least 1935. At Gandhi's request, Carver went to India and uh, discussed with him the subject of agriculture and nutrition in developing countries. This was helpful to Gandhi, who, as most of you will know, was a vegetarian. Well, somebody else asked for his help. Joseph Stalin of Russia sought for Carver's help in the 1930s. Stalin had come up with reforms that, res that backfired, and consequently there was a famine that killed millions of people. Stalin wanted Carver to go and help him to reorganize the cotton plantations in that country. Carver refused the invitation. For almost 50 years, Carver used to produce a bulletin that went out especially to the farmers. Other beneficiaries were teachers and housewives. This was because he not only wrote on his scientific findings and cultivation information, but he also came up with new cooking recipes. In this way, he promoted better health and nutrition for many families, especially in the South. He continued at the same time to publish academic articles in journals in the peanut industry. Apart from that, he maintained a regular newspaper column entitled Professor Carver's Advice. A quick one. In case you're wondering, Carver never married, I mentioned it earlier, and never had a family. At the age of 40, he was in courtship with an elementary school teacher by the name of Susan Hunt. Their courtship lasted three years until she moved on to California to get another job, and that's how that friendship ended. We're coming to the end of this man's life. In January 1943, Carver slipped in his home and fell. This is what led to his death on January the fifth. He was about 78 or 79 years old, depending on where you place his actual date of birth in, in the year of his birth. He left his life savings of $60,000. The equivalent now of $1.2 million. He left it to Tuskegee Institute to be used there. The nation mourned the loss of a hero. People across the racial divide all honored this man. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed legislation for the Carver Monument, which you are seeing there. This was an honor, we can go to the next one, this was an honor that was previously only granted to two American presidents, only to two, and nobody else. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, 
and George Washington Carver. He was the first black American to have a national park named after him. There it is. In 1948, which is five years after his death, he appeared in a commemorative postal stamp. There we are. And in 1951, his face was put on the 50 cent coin in America. Now, when your face is on the currency of a nation, you know that you are honored by the people of that nation. Many years after his death, in 1977, so this is at least 34 years after his death, he was elected to the Hall of Fame for Great Americans. And in 1990, so now we are 50 years and above. He was elected to the National Inventors Hall of Fame. More recently, last year, <laughs> 80, no, 79 years after his death, 79 years, the state of Iowa where he went to do his university studies, declared that from now onwards, meaning 2023, because that's when it was to clock 80 years, from now onwards, every February the 1st is going to be George Washington Carver Day. the way in which you have uh, Kaunda's Day, I don't know which other, which Zambians do we commemorate apart from Kaunda? He's the only one, eh? Okay. So now you, as a whole nation, well, at least that particular state, having this February the 1st as cover day. And remember, that's 80 years after a man has died. But above all, Carver impacted and inspired many lives. He was a role model for many because he lived for one purpose and bettered the lives of many because of that. We should thank God for such a life and seek to imitate him. I want to end with just one quote. And it is a quotation from... Uh, one of the most eloquent um, guys in the fight for equality in America, Martin Luther King Jr. This is what he said. From oppressive and crippling surroundings, George Washington Carver lifting, lifted his searching creative mind to the ordinary peanut and found therein extraordinary possibilities for goods and products unthinkable by minds of the past and left for succeeding generations an inspiring example of how an individual could rise above the paralyzing circumstance, paralyzing conditions of circumstances. We have no excuse today to blame our lack of progress and impact on our poor or bad beginning in life. Let's finish our video. Let's finish our video and then I think it will be Q&A and we are...
I hand back to Mr. Singogo. You can now eat those granuts. If you want. Or you can keep staring at them thinking, ah, sure. Shampoo. We are then in heaven. Another, perhaps greater, as Carver's gift, scientific his contributions accumulated, found another, an perhaps greater platform. gift. His charismatic enthusiasm the YMCA found an was unexpected with platform. The Commission on Interracial Cooperation. The YMCA so was working with together the Commission on Interracial Cooperation. Racial so they were partnering together to try to help and with so racial they tension. Hired George Washington Carver, and he began to speak. And so these they of young hired George Washington Carver, Most of the time and he these began to speak to these groups Carver of young people. Most of the time, these were white young people. Carver was invited to speak. Was white young people. Carver was invited to there was speak some concern at a place called Blue Ridge over what the audience would think of a black person. There was coming some concern there was also over what boys. the audience would think of a black and person coming to speak. Some of them. There was all southern white boys. boys. He was allowed to speak, and they were not expecting some of them. He got up to speak, and he was there to speak about race relations. He was allowed to speak to them, but instead he spoke about He got up to speak, and he was there to speak about race relations and observations. But instead he spoke about discovery, nature, and science. His and race relation speech and discovery was and all the things himself. that were on his heart. I mean, it was his, his race relation speech was himself. These young men didn't it was his example. That he didn't have to say it. When it was all said and done, he'd actually taught them about These young men didn't understand when, when it was all said and done, he'd actually harmony. taught them about there was a beat people of learning to get along together and, and interracial harmony. There was a beat of absolute silence, and then the place erupted in applause. All these young Clemson boys, the place and erupted young college in students, and all white. All these young Clemson boys and, and, and young and college students, students and all white. Questions. So rush to what had been a rush to shake his hand on rush the part to of the organizers questions. turned out to be a triumph. So that what had been a concern on the part of the organizers turned out to be a triumph. Carver understood that two significant challenges faced Southern farmers in the early 20th century. First, after countless decades raising the harsh and demanding but lucrative crops of cotton and tobacco, Southern fields were depleted of much needed nutrients. Additionally, a variety of beetle measuring on the average only six millimeters in length had migrated from Mexico across the Rio Grande River in 1892, eventually reaching Alabama in 1915. Ultimately, the nation's cotton crop would be decimated. The boll weevil was making its way to his part of the South, and he knew that in time that would be a problem. For years, Carver had been trying to come up with another cash crop other than cotton. He came up with several. One of them was the peanut, one was the sweet potato. He also looked at soybeans. He looked at black-eyed peas. All of these were easy to grow, easy on the soil. They could be a cash crop, and they were also very versatile. What he wanted to do was find as many uses for these crops as possible so that people would be more inclined to grow them. Peanuts became the most promising because he found the most different uses. It was almost like the more he looked, the more he saw. Anticipating the boll weevil's ravaging sweep, Carver had developed a characteristically practical remedy for the South. He wasn't pursuing a simple bandage to the problem but instead a comprehensive solution that would sustain the livelihood of farmers. Carver was summoned to present his findings in Washington, D.C., where an unexpected reception awaited him. 
In January of 1921, Carver appeared before the House Ways and Means Committee that was considering a tariff on imported peanuts. He had been hired by the peanut growers to come and basically be a lobbyist. So here is this old guy hunched over with this big box under his arm, walking into the meeting room with the House Ways and Means Committee. He sits down. They say, you've got 10 minutes to tell us what you want to tell us. He started telling them about how valuable peanuts were, how versatile they were, how they were a great crop because they replenished the soil, which didn't require much attention, which could be sold readily, which was good for animal feed. You could make everything from talcum powder to rope to paint to anything else from it. They extended his 10 minutes again, and they extended his 10 minutes again, and finally one of them said, brother, take all the time you want. These members of the house were mesmerized by this little old man. He became known from then on, really, as the Peanut Man. Notoriety and fame came swiftly. America was captivated by the many dimensions of Carver. He was heralded as a great botanist, educator, and inventor. And for his poetry, painting, mentoring, his frugality, and his efforts to improve racial relations. With this broad, you know, sort of renaissance-like experience, Time Magazine even called him the Black Da Vinci. Three American presidents, Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, and Franklin Roosevelt, made it a priority to meet personally with Carver. Late in his life, Carver and Henry Ford became good friends. Thomas Edison offered Carver a job in his laboratory. There are different stories, but probably Edison offered Carver $100,000 a year to come to work at his laboratory. Um, Carver turned it down. He said, no, his people need him, and the South needed him, and he wants to remain in the South. Years later, as Carver's health began to fail, his friend, Henry Ford, installed an elevator in Carver's home so that he would no longer have to climb stairs. In January of 1943, Carver was trying to open the door. He slipped on the ice and fell, and he never really recovered his health after that. He um, sort of slipped into a deep sleep and never woke up. At his passing, there was a nationwide outpouring of thanks and celebration and acknowledgement of all he had been, not only to black people, but, but just as a great American. legacy of George Washington Carver has far-reaching impact today. Everyone thought I was crazy. I'm known as the seed lady. I advocate organics in the hood. I am the queen of ghetto green. I brought organics to the hood in South Los Angeles in the 80s. I've always been very concerned about the health and nutrition of my community, and I've planted many gardens. As a matter of fact, 5,000 in 34 years with the help of a lot of people. That is something that I truly was inspired by Dr. Carver to do. I'm a proud alumnus of Tuskegee. I uh, walked the paths that Dr. Carver walked, you know, I communed in the same areas he communed in and at his graveside. I really feel a, a really deep connection with this man, his life, and what he meant. Welcome to the Carver Food Park. This is 30 garden beds, a uh, big rose garden, you have a greenhouse, and getting involved in the greening of your community, that's what people do here and have been for the last 18 years. Any number of, of ways you might look at great men, Dr. Carver was a great man. His life tells us how we ought to be. George Washington Carver 
had a lot of obstacles in his lifetime. And as a child, especially, he had a lot of roadblocks. When he got to the thicket, he had the machete. He cut down so we all could travel and come behind him. Many people strive for purpose in their life, and we can look at Dr. Carver's life as a role model. He identified things that he could do, the qualities that he had that he could bring to the table, and then worked at it diligently. He gave everything to his work, and he, he did it to leave it for all of us. I appreciate you. The man himself, and I appreciate that he spent helping mankind, not blacks or brown or white. When somebody said that he was a great scientist, you look at it as God used him as an instrument through which he could help mankind. One of the easiest lessons that we can take away from George Washington Carver is the lesson that simply comes from inspiration. Uh, the story is inspirational. He was an American hero. He was, he was a hero for us all. I, I'm hoping this is not the kind of topic people have a lot of questions about, but any questions before I take my seat? Anything that, uh, oh, there is a question here. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I'm sure I'll hear, then I'll repeat it. Yeah. It's like he was going, going, going. There was <laughs> no such a time when we heard that he went back and he got more inspired. Yes, uh, from my reading, he did go back. What I didn't read was whether they were whether they were alive at that time. That's the only thing I'm not aware of. Because where the monument is, the cover uh, monument is actually where he grew up. Yes, so. Uh, the, the work began even before he had died. So he did go back, but as I said, I didn't read as to whether the, the old folks were still there. Good. Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, there's a question at the back there. All right, thank you. So um, according to the discussion we, ha we had in group 12, I asked a question to say, when was George Washington born? And the people were like, the date is not specified, the actual day when he was born. So I just want to find out from you, is it true that the actual date when he was born isn't known, or maybe the day is there? I don't know. OK, uh, the, the SU students arrived a little late. I had already begun to give the narration. And I mentioned the fact that, yes, the date of his birth is 
uncertain, maybe unknown might not be correct, and that there are two dates that are currently sort of possibilities. One was uh, somewhere in January, let me just quickly get it, and then the other one was in July. Um, okay, so here we are. So there was January 14th or July 12th, 1864. Yeah, so those are the dates that I, I, I wouldn't suggest you bet your, your fortune on it because you might end up coming up with a third date. Thank you. Over there. All right. Glad to see quite a number of hands. Uh, so my question is, uh, we also were discussing about something in the same group, Group 12, because we were alive a little bit late. So yeah. the question was, how did he attain his primary and secondary education when uh, we know that the circumstances were bad at that time? Yeah, the black people weren't allowed to go to school. So how did they attain the primary and secondary education? Yeah, it's quite simple. It's what we used to call in Zambia night school. Have you heard of night school? Where you work during the day and then you go for classes in the evenings. That's largely the way he educated. So he educated himself, essentially. He would hire himself out and would be working during the day and then in the evening attending classes. Okay, so that's how he managed to work his way to the end. Thank you very much. There was another hand here, and then we will come to you. Yeah, the, the microphone is coming. Okay. Uh, was Kava a holy man or not? Say it again. Was Kava. Okay, remove it from your mouth and just talk, yeah. Was Kava a, a holy man or not? If not, what were his weaknesses? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we were able to cover that. We saw his conversion, we also saw his passion for God in everything. We saw how he never began his lectures without bringing God into the subject. We saw all that. If one was to say, you know, any possible weakness, we may be referring, for instance, to the way he, he tended to want to resign as they were uh, sort of knocking heads with his boss um, because he, he really was trying to get a bigger share of the crop. Um, I, I'm not aware of any others that one would uh, bring out, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Singogo read if a number of his uh, sayings. Um, I could just quickly draw your attention to one or two more, and you will see that they speak about uh, somebody who no doubt wants uh, to live for, for God in, um, in everything. Um, let me just pull out one here. Um, he, he says, uh, yeah, maybe two. When our thoughts, which bring actions, are filled with hate against anyone, negro or white, we are in a living hell. That is as real as hell will ever be. While hate for our fellow man gives us a living hell, holding good thoughts for them brings an opposite state of living, one of happiness, Success, peace, we are then in heaven, meaning heaven on earth. But listen to this. We get closer to God as we get more intimately and understandingly acquainted 
with the things he has created. I know of nothing more inspiring than that of making discoveries <clears throat> for oneself. So in other words, you've got a, an, an, a curious mind enough to engage it in investigative research in God's world, religiously, and you find a lot of satisfaction in, in that. Okay, so there seems to have been a life lived around God. We also remember I mentioned a Bible study that he began, and out of that Bible study it grew to the point where they literally had no space because the students were sitting on top of each other to hear him expound God's word. Yeah. Thank you very much. There was a hand somewhere there. Thank you. Um, I have three questions, or two questions. The first one is, what is the name of the documentary? The one that we are from watching. Okay. And how would, could one uh, extract information from a documentary? I, because I can see that from the documentary you came up with three lectures. So how could one extract? Came up with three what? Lectures. Oh, no, no. It's me who divided it into three. Yeah, I but, understand. But don't worry. Uh, I'll send you the link. Sure. Uh, so all of you as students who have the link, you'll be able to access this documentary. Thank you. I'll include a small bill at the bottom. <laughs> uh, Natasha here. Hello. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, you mentioned he became a Christian when he was young. Uh, did he identify himself with any church or movement at that yeah. time, or it was just him uh, preaching the word of God? Yeah, yeah. The most common church among the uh, slaves and former slaves was what even now is called the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME. So that was by far the most common. And the reason why it had that name was because initially the slaves were not being allowed in churches. So they were going to the Methodist Episcopal Church. And then they broke away, and that's how it became the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Yeah. Maybe in due season he may have moved on to other churches, but that you can take it almost for granted that those that were in that part of the world then, that would have been a common church. The, in due season, the blacks also broke away from the Baptist churches and began what they called Baptist missionary churches. So that would have been another possibility in which they would find themselves. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a hand right at the back there. I'm quite, I thought you people were tired, as tired as I am. <laughs> All right, yes. thank you. Um, God, when I heard that, he got to be friends with my God, my Gandhi. And I did a quick research, and Gandhi is a, he was a Hindu. So can we conclude that he was yoking with non-believers or... Was he doing a right thing to be friends with Mahathir Gandhi, who was a Hindu and not a Christian? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, George Washington Carver was helping everybody. He wasn't choosing that I'm only going to help Christians. He was helping everybody. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi was one of those individuals that he began to relate to. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually read Mahatma Gandhi's story, but he was largely influenced by Christians, largely influenced by Christians. He, he had a, a, a loving relationship 
with, with Christians. When he, 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 he was a lawyer in South Africa before he went back to, to India. And while as a lawyer in South Africa, he was running a newspaper, the actual editor of that newspaper, the shadow editor, the one who was actually working behind him, was the pastor of Johannesburg Baptist Church. And they were extremely close. Uh, there was a time when he was beaten up, and it was that same pastor. He was beaten up by his fellow Indians because he was saying, let's not fight. And they were tired of this pacifism, so they beat him up. He was taken into a, a, the, the same Baptist pastor's house to be nursed back to health. And, and so forth. Uh, there's a biography that's coming out. I don't know when it will come out, but I hope it's soon, on uh, the lady Olive Dock, who is still probably the longest serving Baptist missionary in Zambia. She died in 1972. And uh, her correspondence with Mahatma Gandhi, you just have to type it, even in where you are sitting right now, if you type Mahatma Gandhi Olive Dock, the correspondence will come up because it's, it's been uh, put into electronic form. Um, and he specifically was asking her to learn from her Christian truth. So he was definitely an individual that was, uh, in that sense, open. But coming back to Washington Curver, he was helping everybody. I mean, imagine how do you transform the economy of the bottom half of America if you are sort of looking around with a microscope for Christians. You, you can't do that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? There's one here. Just keep your hand up. Yeah. For the microphone. Yes. Yes. Uh Yes, uh, we get to find out that uh, George Washington's father died before he was even born, and his mother was being taken away. Uh, now, I want to find out how many years did it take uh, from the time his mother left to the time Moses Craver came and uh, picked um, George. Got him. It yes, was and just he, and he, George in slavery. It was just, oh, first of all, it was within a few days yeah. that he was rescued. He was found at the end of the state, about to be taken into another state. But because he was a baby and he was sickly, obviously they assumed he would die. And that's why they were able to find him and then the guy traded a horse to, to get him back. Okay, so he, it was, he was about just eight months old, so less than one year old. And that's why he would never even remember the face of his mother. Now, that would have been, uh, let me try and remember the year. Um, so your question is, how many years between that and slavery ending? Well, as soon as he was taken back, there's no way that um, the covers would treat him as a slave. He's a baby and his brother. So all they did was to bring them into their home and raise them up. So whether slavery was there or not was beside the point. So they became like children in the home, participating in looking after the activities of the home. Okay, thank you. One more, if any. One more. Good. Oh, there we are. One more. Okay, so it's, it's said that um, George's father was never known, but he has a brother. So my question is, is George and his elder brother, are they biological brothers or? Yeah. They are? Yes. 
Yes, the, it's not that he was not known. He was known. He was an actual slave that was bought. So his name was Giles, I think. Let me just quickly counter check. Um, I had his name. Yes, Giles. So Mary and her husband, Giles, were bought for $700 from a William McGuinness on October 9, 1855. So they were bought because that man was owing this gentleman money. So in exchange for money, since he couldn't pay, the man took the couple as slaves. So they, they had children. They had, uh, in fact, some accounts mention that it wasn't just his mother that was taken, his sister was taken as well, and together with him. So, but what happened is that night, Jim escaped in the night. So they, they didn't catch him. But they, everybody else they found in the home, they took. So there was an actual family. Uh, that was in that home. But uh, the, it is said that the father died in an accident. They were holding something, and then in the process, that's how he was killed while his wife was pregnant. So it was in, in the actual activities on the farm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And it's been good to have uh, the, the, young, the younger ones asking all the questions. Mr. Singogo, over to you. Okay. What we'll do is uh, we are now coming to, to the end. Um, since you've been sitting for a long time, come be our national anthem. We'll sing our national anthem. After we've sung our national anthem, you are tired of the national anthem. <laughs> you are tired of the national anthem. <laughs> our national anthem, Kombe. Then uh, we will be winding down, right? What comes, what goes up, comes down. The law of gravity. National anthem. After the national anthem, I we'll just, will just want, again, the young people, I will just allow about five statements. I want to know what you have learned from this whole process. That's all. Just tell me just one thing that you are taking away with you, right? After the national anthem. National anthem. All right. Those who have good voices to lead the national anthem, can sing the national anthem for today. It's only for today. Okay? We can stand the national anthem. I can see the young men, uh, energetic young men.
Thank you very much. Now, um, remember, SU students, please, you registered when you came. Please re-register, okay, with Joseph at the back there. You registered when you came, re-register. Um, let me just read again the philosophy of this gentleman. But before I do that, I think let me also read a statement because there seems to be some doubt about whether this person was a Christian. He was a Christian. He became a Christian at age 10. Okay, now I want you to listen to this statement that he said about him in terms of his conduct. You see, when you are a Christian, there are two principal things that happen to you. First of all, you have your vertical relationship with the Lord correct. Then you also have your horizontal relationship with other believers also correct. Now, if you want to remember this vertical relationship and your horizontal relationship, since we are talking of a scientist, how many know what photosynthesis is? Photosynthesis. Uh -huh. So photosynthesis, you get the sun from, uh, from the sky. The right relationship. Then after having got the right relationship from God through photosynthesis, assuming you were a plant, since he loved plants, then now it is osmosis, osmosis, you know, with it horizontally. So photosynthesis, then osmosis eh, with, other, with other believers. So that's what you should do. Remember, he had the, his photosynthesis was correct. His osmosis was correct with other people. This is how he thought about people, God's people, all people. That's why even, he could even relate to Mahatma Gandhi. Listen to this statement. Listen well. He loved everyone, including Mahatma Gandhi. Are we together? Because I hated Mahatma Gandhi. He loved everyone, including Mahatma Gandhi. Because what was his biblical worldview about people? Because he saw in everyone, okay, an expression, a manifestation of God. That's what drove him. So when he saw white people who were troubling him, for him, he saw that these same white people who are troubling me, they are a creation of God. The reason why they are troubling me, the principle is they meant it for evil, but God must be teaching me something. So he was a Christian. His conduct was Christian. You can't miss it. And this same Mahatma Gandhi, the one who asked the question about Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, first of all, my reading, he was not a Christian. Okay, let's be very clear about that. Mahatma Gandhi was a good person. He also suffered racism. But the reaction of Mahatma Gandhi to racism was nafileka. It's nafileka. If this is the way I'm going to be treated, nafileka. But the, treatment, the, the same uh, George uh, Washington Caver, when he suffered the same racism, he did not say nafileka. He held on. His eyes were fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the difference between the reaction of Mahatma Gandhi and Washington. Are we together? Nafilek, because no, if this is the way I'm going to be treated, I'm going away. He did not have his eyes on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the difference between Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi did suffer racism, but it is the response to this racism that makes the difference. Let me read the philosophy. And then there is ACU, remember, there is still some food for you after we have finished. There is still some food for you. Listen to the philosophy and then I'll call Pastor Mbewe to come and now wrap up and also close in prayer. No individual has any right to come into this world and go out of it without leaving behind him or her distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. How far you go in life, again, it depends on your attitude, depends on your being tender with the young, 
compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant with the weak and strong, because someday in life you will have been all of this. Means you can be weak, you can be strong, you can be young, you can be old. It means that one of the things that informs a Christian, not that a Christian doesn't go through bad experiences, it, but it is your response which will determine, are you really a Christian? Your response to these bad circumstances is what determines. If you're going to be like Mahatma Gana Fileka, what Fileka? Oh. But if you're going to be like George, you'll be able to see beyond the suffering and be able to see the grace of God. So, can I have just five ACU students to just explain in one sentence what you have learned today? What is your takeaway? I don't want to say no. What is it that you are taking away from this session? I love that hand. I see a hand here. <laughs> a hand here. Yes, my dear. What yes. have you learned today which has impacted you as a person? Uh, what has impacted me as a person is uh, the life of George Washington, which was, he had a relationship with God, and therefore, even though he was a scientist, it was God who was moving him from one place to another, and the love of nature, he loved nature and helping people, not just, he wasn't into uh, judging people according to their color, but he was loving everyone because he was, being, him being a Christian, I think what you have learned is good. Some other hands, uh, the man there in blue with a cross. And uh, please be brief. We are now in the what we call injury time, you know. I bring it down. Oh, I Quickly. Brief. Uh, uh, so, uh, you said one sentence? One sentence and brief. Okay. The sentence uh, should be said briefly. Be strong. Uh, I've learned that be strong in Colamdeo, let it read you. Thank you. Colamdeo, okay, good. Yes, here, although I didn't mention the, the, the presentation, there was no Colamdeo. Yes. Um, one of the things that I've learned uh, is that uh, uh, George Washington was uh, determined, he was forecast, and also ultimately he in everything that he did, God was the one that uh, was if before and after everything. Okay. That's it. Two more. There's, I see a red there, t-shirt written. What's it? What is it written there? Is it written Jesus? Okay, whatever is written. Yes. Short. Okay, uh, one thing that I've learned is no matter how life hits you, you should be persistent. Yes. There's uh, this, my daughter there in white. I've learned that there are two things that lead to fruitfulness, and that is commitment to spiritual growth and intense desire to learn. Wow. Clap for her. Uh -huh. Now clap for yourselves. <laughs> clap for the presenter. <laughs> okay. Pastor, as the presenter, they've clapped. Now you need to come and close and also close in prayer. Yeah, yeah, well... I think all has been said and done. Uh, we have looked at a life that probably had a worse beginning than all of us in here. Eh? Is there anybody here who feels your beginning was worse than his? And yet, he did not allow that to hold him. He lived with God. He lived for God. 
And that's the appeal that comes to all of us in here, but especially to those of you who have more of life in front of you than us who've got more life behind us. That you follow after his example. And one of the reasons why every year at Kawata Baptist Church, we hold the Heroes of the Faith Day, we hold it every year, is so that we can see not just one another, because then we will all backslide, but that we can see others who've gone ahead of us, whom God will say, look at them, what's your excuse? And we hope that way we will be challenged as individuals. So what that has done to you, I don't know. But all of us must respond. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity you've given us today, coming away from so many other activities. Our SU students will have a, a, a small uh, exam this evening and yet they were willing to come and spend the day here with us. We thank you for each one of these young lives and continue to pray that you will impact them for good, for time and for eternity. But we pray for the rest of us as well, O oh God, that you will be kind to us to put into practice what we have learned so that we might emulate the peanut man. Now may your grace, your love, and your fellowship go with each one of us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Joseph, where are they registering? Okay, so Joseph is there. Please register with him. We will compare those who registered at the beginning and those who register now so that we...